So one of my favorite topics is how we have done a great job at reducing cardiovascular mortality in the United States. Uh, but yes, this is 2018. This is actually well, the hundredth year that heart disease is the number one killer. I was hoping when I uh, came into the American College of Cardiology leadership, I was uh, talking about how I wanted to be number two. This is it. This is gonna. This is gonna happen. Maybe we won't last a hundred years. It's interesting that a uh, hundred years ago it was the end of World War One, and uh, as it was winding down, there was an outbreak of a very serious flu. The Spanish flu, as it was called. There was nothing Spanish about it, by the way. The reason it was called the Spanish flu was because pretty much everyone else was in the war, and no one wanted uh, it known that they were weakened by this mass of humanity and death uh, that was going on in their countries. Spain was neutral in the war, and so their press reported what was going on. So it got called the Spanish flu when it wasn't at all. The big characteristic of it, uh, relevant to heart disease, is that it actually had a W-shaped mortality curve, which we normally don't see. It's usually young uh, infants, uh, early childhood people who are dying, and older people dying from the flu. So what happened in the middle is that the stronger you were, the more your immune system would tear you apart. Well, that's what it took. By 1919, the Spanish flu epidemic was still going on around the world, uh, building large facilities uh, similar to what's happening now uh, in the United States, uh, people adding on places to try to take care of all the people. Um, but heart disease was number one again, even though this was still going on. And it's persisted ever since. Now, and there was a point uh, about two years ago where we thought the lines were going to cross, and there were some states in the United States where the lines did cross, where the heart disease was dropping about 5% per year mortality, and, and cancer mortality was dropping, but it was only dropping about 3%, and they were gonna touch. In a couple places, they actually did cross. But overall, in the United States, uh, they, we never did quite get to number two, and then last year, the mortality rate went up for heart disease. The CDC is blaming it, particularly on the obesity epidemic and diabetes. And obviously, there, you could think as an epidemi epidemiologist that if you extend people's lives, that sooner or later they're going to die. And so all that life extension was going to catch up with you at some point, and people who would have died, say, in 2009, dying in 2016, um, you've done life extension, but they're still going to die. And so you could put those three factors together, but what it's really telling us is that we still have an opportunity. We're not gonna, you know, our, you know, our mortality rate is 100%. That's, um, that's the way it is, uh, with a few biblical exceptions, right? Um, but what we're going to see uh, is that a lot of the preventable deaths uh, from obesity and diabetes are things that we could deal with with nutrition and prevention and education of the population uh, that everybody, if everyone was a thin walking vegetarian, we would have t taken care of this cardiovascular issue a long time ago. I'd have to look uh, uh, because I actually don't know the answer for today. I do know that uh, by 2020, it was estimated that it was going to be about 18 percent, um, and this is considered not sustainable. Now, interestingly enough, and people don't probably don't talk about this uh, enough, but there are economists who say, you know, it's pretty much you've got it upside down. Not only is it sustainable, but it's important because it's become such a large portion of the gross domestic product that. Uh, the economy is actually revolving around health care. Uh, it, it's a massive enterprise. It employs a lot of people. Uh, we have a lot of structures that uh, are actually extending human lives. And so that this is not a bad thing. But for the most part, those, the, you know, the few economists who say that are sort of, uh, you know, they're, they're looking at it in a, a, mic, a macroeconomic way where you can understand what they're saying. But I'd like to break that down and just think of what is it that we're really talking about? It's a basically human suffering, okay? And so suppose we were to make it 20 or 30 percent and that's all we did was take care of the illnesses that are occurring. Is that something we should continue to do? To try really hard 
to uh, improve the lives of people, and let's do the economy on other things. I mean, there are other, you know, fantastic things that we could do. We could do interplanetary travel, for goodness sakes. We don't have to spend it on health care um, if, we, if we're talking about preventable illnesses. That's a really good question. Um, I, I deal much more with cardiovascular stuff. So, of course, my answer uh, relevant to that is going to be uh, the number of patients on Medicare who have cardiovascular disease. If I had to pick out one, it's systemic hypertension. So 58% of all Medicare beneficiaries have hypertension, and about 30% of the budget for, the, for Medicare is actually spent on hypertension, drugs, hospitalizations, heart failure, stroke, heart attack, uh, outpatient visits, um, as, along with the medications. This is a, a burden that really should not exist. We all talk about you know, coronary plaque and eating animal products and filling up your arteries with, coronary, with, with uh, coronary plaque, but hypertension, right along with it, it's been shown that if people are doing a, a healthy lifestyle, uh, we can reduce this burden of hypertension tr tremendously. We have uh, new American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology guidelines that came out in November that uh, upset a lot of, uh, of folks by redefining hypertension as anything above 130, uh, 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 over 90. And it's uh, interesting that the pushback is that they were thinking, well, this is just going to increase the number of drugs that are prescribed, when that was really not the case, that many people have actually take, taken a look at it. And, and one of them did say that, it, oh yeah, it probably would increase drug use by about 3%. But what we really talk about in those guidelines is changing lifestyle. If people were not heavy drinkers, if people were to get closer to their ideal body weight, if they were to exercise uh, on a daily basis and back off of the animal products, particularly saturated fat, the blood pressure would improve dramatically. And we would uh, just remove that burden that Medicare has. And Medicare is a, it's, it's a tough problem. You know, it, it was set up to take care of older people for a short period of time. And then we started actually saving lives with it and extending life. And so they're auto every time we save a life, they're, they're somehow financially burdened. So we either have to pour more resources into it, which is difficult to do, or improve the health of the people who are older. And you know, nutrition, exercise, lifestyle are the keys to doing this. Back when I was in medical school, the number one killer around the world was, I believe, schistosomiasis, okay? It was parasitic diseases. Uh, they were unavoidable in many third world countries, and it was just very difficult. And then uh, things started to shift, and there were other infectious diseases, and then it became what we call non-communicable diseases. And that is the, the typical Western world diseases of hypertension, diabetes, coronary heart disease. And at this point, globally, coronary heart disease is the number one killer. And this is really happening because of the, you could call it westernization, but it's the modernization, uh, having uh, less need to be out in a field working, uh, more convenience food, high fat, high, uh, rapidly absorbable carbohydrates. And so we have access to every, all of this around the world. And it really is taking its toll in heart disease. I'm hoping that that country will be the United States, but someone beat us to it. When I was in medical school in the late 70s, uh, uh, there, the number one uh, heart disease nation was actually Finland. And it uh, had a lot to do with the diet, uh, very high in cholesterol, very high in fat. And uh, it, I remember reading about this, that uh, there was one section in North Karelia where they really tried to influence how people ate and smoking as well. And uh, by decreasing uh, just the use of butter, for example, uh, they were able to get uh, folks on board decrease the, the amount of uh, saturated fat that people were eating, uh, but 
can't discard the, the smoking <laughs> cessation, um, as well as uh, eating animals in general and doing more fruits and vegetables. And just fruits, vegetables, and, and smoking cessation drop their cardiovascular death rate by about 50% over a couple of decades. And uh, that's a really a good success story that we all should, should talk about. Uh, it's interesting that uh, uh, folk, uh, there are uh, people who talk about um, the World War II and invasion of countries and taking away the animals from the people and seeing decreases in, in um, heart disease. Um, those are really complicated uh, uh, situations. The dynamics there are, it's very hard to say when, when people are dying of other things uh, because they're in a war, for example, you know, whether and, and how well are they coding for cardiovascular disease. Those are tough ones, but the Finland data is actually, you know, it was purposeful, it was prospective, uh, and no question that you can impact um, a cardiovascular mortality by changing the dynamics of, of what people do. We have stuff, uh, similar data uh, here in New York uh, that m many people are aware of, but maybe not. Uh, there's been uh, data that's published on smoking cessation in public places, decreasing heart attack rates, and more recently in the last couple weeks, there was a wonderful publication on the trans fat um, uh, ban. And there are several counties uh, in New York that have focused on uh, removing trans fats, and you actually can see that all heart attack rates are decreasing all around, but the ones where the trans fats have been banned the decrease in heart attacks is actually faster. We can all do this.